Australia, long been perceived as the lucky country, democratic, modern, prosperous, and so long as socioeconomic business as usual maintains itself, we'll likely continue to experience some of the highest living standards in the world. However, this way of life as to which we've become so accustomed is far from sustainable. In 2015, I had the pleasure of being invited to northern Morocco by an NGO group called Morocco Integral to teach practical permaculture and regenerative agriculture courses to a village on the lakes of Lake, Lake Wada in uh, the foothills of the Rift Mountains. Uh, it sounded like a dream opportunity and I went to work constructing a curriculum and soon I experienced some misgivings about it. I was thinking to myself, what on earth am I, a 34-year-old Southwest Australian guy going to teach an ancient rural people about anything. It just didn't make sense to me. But, you know, I did what I could. I constructed a curriculum. And fast forward a few weeks, I remember arriving in Morocco. And after 35 hours of traveling, cresting this ridge and seeing in front of me these barren, dry hills of the landscape of which the farm was situated on, the sun was setting. And my heart sunk. I remember thinking to myself, yeah, what on earth am I doing here? And I went to bed with really low morale, I remember. The next day I awoke, uh, class was at nine. It was in an old circus tent on the lake shore. And I introduced myself to the students. It was about 25 villagers. Um, I remember looking down at my notes, getting ready to start the course and letting out this big sigh. And I kind of went with my gut instinct and I put my notes aside and I realised without a context, without me understanding their context, my work could be all but useless. So I asked them, do you mind if I ask you about yourselves? And they seemed reluctant at first but eventually agreed and so I began an inquiry. I asked them, who are you? How do you refer to yourselves? Do you identify as a family, as village, tribe, nation, regionally? How do you see yourselves? And how do you live? How do you grow what you grow? How do you make the money you need? We mapped a monthly input, output, products and waste list and I got a very clear idea of what they were about and how they lived. I then asked the elders there, what was it like when you guys were kids? Was it any different? And they said, well, yeah, in fact, the, the lake that we're situated on, in the late 80s, it was a, a, a valley and the Moroccan government had constructed a hydroelectric plant and the once verdant, fertile, rich valley in which they had grown their tree crops and run their animals and raised their vegetables was now tens of metres underwater. And I realised that these people had gone through a shock, a trauma. They had been severed from the land upon which they, they belonged and they were struggling to catch up with who they were they were struggling to catch up with the fact that they were a valley people who are now trying to learn how to be a freshwater people. It was a big aha moment for me in relationship between humans and the land upon which they dwell. Um, it was only after two or three days I felt comfortable with actually teaching them any permaculture. I knew them well enough now. And we went around to their houses and we did little uh, diagrams and models and plans as to how to best design their properties. And I knew I was onto a good thing when the youngsters started showing up to class the next day, having done their own designs completely unprompted. And in fact, afterwards, I, after I'd left, I got an email from the director who said that the villagers had actually been holding sittings to talk about reinstating their old common law system, which hadn't been in use for generations. It had a real effect on me that trip and I remember returning to Australia um, with what felt like new eyes. It was as if the last 15 years prior to that of me studying permaculture and regenerative agriculture and all these things, ecology, anthropology, it had coalesced into this new lens through which I saw humanity in direct relationship to the planet and the beautiful dance that can occur between the two or not so beautiful in some cases. And I looked around Australia and I realised then that contemporary Australian cultures are acutely maladjusted to the ecological realities of the continent. And more than that is that the land itself and the people of Australia are suffering from a lack of meaningful connection. This slide shows a group of young women in New South Wales in the 1890s playing tennis and croquet in the midday sun um, in full English garb, like petticoat, stockings, uh, bonnets, full sleeves, the works. I doubt they would have been very comfortable, 
but it was as if they hadn't quite cottoned on yet to the fact they weren't in England. And we're still doing that in many ways. And the cultural pra practices that were insisted upon this landscape was very degrading to the ecology. It was very lucrative to the empire, but a very swift and acute ecological degradation occurred as a result. Because Australia is very different. It's incredibly different. I mean, Antarctica is the single most anomalous and extreme continent on the planet. Second to that, it's us. We are the, the driest, the flattest, the oldest. The weather is completely different. The hydrology, the geology, the flora, the fauna, it's totally unique. I remember in Morocco, an uh, elderly woman asking me, uh, so where exactly are you from, Byron? And I thought to myself, well, I said, nowhere really exotic, just Western Australia. And she looked at me and her jaw dropped and she said, are you kidding me? That's super exotic. That's, is it, that's, like, that's like the Congo Basin or the North Pole. That's as exotic as it gets. And I thought to myself, yeah, she's right. It's pretty different down there. Um, but we don't quite appreciate that. We haven't take, we've taken it for granted. And we haven't learnt how to live here sustainably. And it's understandable why, because the genesis of European Australia was pretty full on. I mean, these people were taken from the streets of their homelands, put in the hulls of large ships where they were fed rotting bread and brackish water for eight months. And those who survived found themselves in an alien land where they were used as slave labour to build infrastructure for the empire until they died. Not the rosiest of beginnings. And since then, it's been survive, 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 survive. With welfare from Mother England, like pulling us up by the bootstraps, you know. And then those uh, economies and industries that we did develop have all been extractive. Conventional agriculture is extractive. Logging, extractive. Mining, it's take, take, take. We haven't learned to live in symbiosis and relationship with the land, giving back to it when it, when it needs to. And of course, the loss of uh, Australian Indigenous culture to the degree that it has is you know, unspeakable tragedy. 80,000 years, I mean, let that sink in, of intimate, deep, sacred relationship born of thousands of generations of trial and error between a people and the landscape. Um, thanks to the works of the likes of Bruce Pascoe and Bill Gamage, the um, mainstream Australia is now coming to appreciate the reality of that sacred and elegant relationship between Indigenous Australia and the land. And it's of my opinion that we need to humbly request that the Indigenous community share with us what remains of those land stewarding practices for the sake of all Australians and for the country itself, the land. There is more good news though. There is a movement known as regenerative agriculture and I've been involved with it for the last 15 odd years and I'm blessed to have been so because it's fascinating. But what is regenerative? Well, I look at it as like a spectrum. Currently, we're in a state of atrophy or degeneration where we're using more resources than our natural world, which is the foundation, the primary economy is the ecology and it's not keeping up with our withdrawals. The next step on the rung is sustainability and we'd love to be there and there's lots of talk about it. We're not there yet, but it's not even the ideal end goal because it's kind of, it's just treading water, you know, it's breaking even. It's uh, like earning a thousand bucks a week but spending a thousand dollars a week. You're not getting anywhere. We want to aim for a regenerative space. So re a regenerative is a dynamic state in which a system, whether it's ecological or financial or social, by default of its own processes, actually increases its own resource base. And that can be done. That's what nature does. So regenerative agriculture is the study and practice of systems which provide humanity with all of our needs, whether food, fibre, water, shelter, etc., while simultaneously increasing the abundance and resilience and beauty of the natural world, which is our own resource base. The amazing thing about regenerative agriculture is that Australia, Australians are considered thought leaders in this, this realm internationally. In fact, many of the pillars, the foundational pillars of Regen Ag, as it's known sometimes, are Australian. This is a property known as Yobani in New South Wales, which is developed by geoengineer P.A. Yeomans in the 50s. He designed, he developed the key line design system, which informed the designing of this landscape. And it's a system which seeks to uh, used water and topography in such a way as to ostensibly drought-proof Australian properties. You can see how beautiful the result is as well. 
Unfortunately, it's not taught in Australian tertiary landscape design, ecology or agricultural studies. Another aspect of the key line uh, movement is the key line subsoil ploughing, which decompacts the ground and allows the plant's roots or rhizosphere to increase and store carbon. This was in Mexico. A friend of mine from the US, Owen Hublitzel, ran one of these ploughs over a dry uh, clay pan, which had been that way for years and years. And after the next rains, that occurred. The seed bank was there. It just needed a bit of decompaction. Holistic management is another pillar of founda uh, foundational pillar of regenerative agriculture, and it seeks to emulate the ways in which these large grazing herds of herbivores, like you see on the Serengeti and David Attenborough documentaries, move across the landscape like swarms, having a beneficial impact. They actually help improve the land. They mow it all down, they chip it all up with their feet because they're nervous and tightly packed because there's predators around. They manure and fertilize it, then they move on and leave it. And they might not be back for years and years. And after the rains, the plants regrow and they can make further deposits of carbon into the soil, regenerating the soil, leaving it better than it was before. Permaculture, another pillar of Regen Ag, is uh, another Australian development, developed in the 70s by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. David Holmgren's actually from Fremantle. And it's a design modality which allows us to most efficiently and effectively place elements of a design in relationship to each other, creating regenerative human settlement systems. Um, so where to from here? Well, just about every community has a permaculture organisation or two. They're becoming very popular. So if you're interested, I urge you to go and seek them out and get to know them. They're an amazing introduction to regenerative agriculture. Uh, take your kids along. Kids love this stuff. I have three kids. They've been raised with this stuff and they absolutely adore it. It's second nature to them. And I'd love to see this stuff get brought into schools. If ecology is the foundation of agriculture and agriculture is the foundation of culture, why aren't we teaching our kids about our foundations? We also need to be supporting and advocating for regenerative agricultural pr principles to be implemented in the agricultural community. We need to support the agricultural community. They're the ones uh, between a rock and a hard place. They're creating food for us all in this harsh Australian climate and on the other side, the realities of a commodity-based industry. So yes, Australia is different. It is very precious and rare, and it's very challenging as well. But we now have so many tools at our disposal to help create a regenerative future if we so choose. I mean, can you imagine what we could create here? Permaculture has been called a revolution disguised as gardening. And I think that's very apt. But I'd go a step further to say that this entire movement is actually the means by which humanity can take these embryonic steps back towards meaningful connection with the land, the planet, which is both our home and our mother. Thank you. <laughs>